this week on Hermitcraft. That off. There we go. Oh, that's better. I mean, that's this, can't, better. this can't this can remotely be better. No. <laughs> Take it. Welcome to the Hermitcraft recap. My name is Pixariffs. Our writer is Loy XP, and they finally killed the Ender Dragon. God, it took them long enough. It's week one on Hermitcraft Season 9, which means everyone's settling into the comfortable routine of reshaping the world around them, building giant eldritch statue creatures, breaking the laws of physics, and describing Buckingham Palace as a starter house they'll probably turn into a shop later. It's all the more humorous to see them go into the dragon fight with the worst equipment possible, a bunch of wooden swords and leather hats. Though the final lizard generally isn't something you can shake a stick at, the group eventually splinters it to death and departs for the outer end to score some shulker boxes. So it's been a week into this glorious mess, and the game is beaten, mostly, into submission. Let's take a look at all the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Now, somehow, the theme of inadequate equipment caught on across the server in a series of unrelated events up to Good Times with Scar's Netherite Ho. ZF, for one, makes it a challenge to put together the worst possible best set of gear, and commissions from Impulse SV a fully enchanted Efficiency 5 wooden pickaxe. I take it you've seen my request? Yes, I have questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. Uh, uh, go ahead, shoot. Despite, well, the general concept of reason, Impulse delivers, and field testing even returns surprising results. Ready? Okay. You do the counter this time. Whoa. I don't, that's... How? Uh, this is... I was not <laughs> expecting that. They must have the same, like, speed or something. Which is fortunate for Zed, seeing as how it's his only silk touch tool, and he'll have to use it for real, actually. The dig takes the shape of a cylinder in a hill he chooses as home. Though unlike the cave of contraptions before it, this time the base is to be filled in from top to bottom. It doesn't help that the build palette consists of quartz blocks, which may just be a month too early a block choice. And so that'd be very nice. These aren't the final positions for things either, by the way. We'll move them around and make them look pretty when we actually have more of a base. The whole reason Zed can have an overpowered, underpowered pickaxe is because Impulse SV puts the community's needs before his own, and what the community needs right now is enchanting. Figuring he can farm XP levels at the skeleton spawner while everyone else is flinging themselves into caves, he sets up an enchanting service where people place orders and drop off their gear, and he enchants it to their specifications. It helps when people can pay as well as XP Crafted can, because then Impulse might actually get to enchant some diamond gear of his own. But with some villagers working diligently on the upstairs floor, one way or another he'll get to pocket some diamonds himself. And that should do it! I mean, I can't think of what else I might be missing from like the perfect pair of boots. Job is done! And uh, I'm thinking I might start on my… my own stuff? And while no amount of feather falling will help with ZF's challenge of falling from build height to bedrock, that doesn't matter as much when you've got a boat handy. I'm gonna nail this one and… perfect! Ha! <laughs> a similar test of dig strength is taken by Grian and Scar, who apply the same strength tool to a different strength material. With one of them digging just above Deep Slate and another just below it, the two take a swing at branch mining and come out to some interesting results. Okay, come on in, son. Oh, get out. <laughs> I didn't get Aww. any for the first 20 minutes. It also helps that Grian starts selling wooden pickaxe supplies out of his living rock, even if his methods of tree farming may be a tad questionable. Is this permanent? How, how much is this going to be sticking around? <laughs> um, no, well, uh, it's all coming down, and then hopefully going back up again, but bigger. You know, I'm, I'm going to spread the moss through your boulder, buddy. No! <laughs> no! <laughs> Technically a tree farm, Grian's orchard of assorted arbory surrounds Mumbo's starter home enough to form a protective wall, which no doubt saves him from the attack of cod-headed salmon yeeters Pearl sent at Grian's house. I definitely deserve this. <laughs> That's it, she wins. You win, you win Pearl. No more. No, 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 no more of this. Ironically, when faced with a prank himself, Grian quickly forfeits before this whole thing grows out of proportion. To signify that they got logs now, a custom tree is added to the boulder's top, and any tree is removed from Mumbo's house. The question is, for how long? Mumbo begins this season by pledging to be confusingly rich. Naturally, this begins with a mining trip where he brings two other potential targets to confuse the mobs while he works on the rich part. He and Grian mostly survive by using Scar as a canary for their early game mining, but when Mumbo takes to the deep slate layers searching for his first diamonds, he's lucky enough to have supplies delivered to him. I have just recently cooked up a delicious batch of uh, Rain Dogs Giga Pies. Right. 
It's my grandmother's recipe. Iron pickaxe um, deep slate mining. No. It looks like fun. Not at all. I'm hating every second. These riches will be stored in a vault which he builds in episode one to protect his valuables from prying eyes, thereby confusing both other hermits and his audience, and possibly even himself, about whether or not he actually has any valuables. Did he just wax my copper? You? Did you wax my copper? Did you wax my copper? Did you wax my copper? He asked calmly. Of course, like many of his server mates, he takes a few shortcuts to getting geared up. The first shortcut being directly through the wall of trees Green grew around his house. Uh, you know what I didn't quite expect is that uh, my tree farm can be countered by one small hole. The second being to mine for iron in the tallest mountain possible, and the third being to rely on dock and impulse for enchanted equipment. Me. I guess the one positive of this situation is that probably more raw iron than I've ever had could have been spent just building an iron farm. I could have built an iron farm and had infinite iron for the rest of the series. Finally though, he needs slime, and since he's unable to locate a slime chunk because the world seed is a secret, he puts together a swamp surface slime farm, which naturally only operates during the night and then most effectively when the moon is full. Good luck doing that on a server with B-double-O. Rendog's Season 9 debut kicks off with some Guardians of the Galaxy level cinematics, so check that out if you want to marvel at the production quality. Once he's back down to Earth though, Ren immediately starts feeling out who he can get IOUs and taxes from, which is probably why he puts himself in the doghouse shortly afterwards. No taxation without incorporation, and Ren's first corporate venture is a pumpkin pie business, but first he needs to install the new Gigacorp firmware update, which comes with its own office assistant. They are in communication with Rosie now, I Your current location is... Hello? Enormous Cave. Rosie? Your Gigapod delivery is arriving soon. Please locate biome. Mushroom Island. The new voices in his head tell him to locate a mushroom island, but before he can do that, he hits a huge iron vein which provides the resources he needs to set up a combination sugarcane, egg and pumpkin farm in a series of epic time lapses which also give the business an outer shell, a storefront and a name, Giga Pies. He then proceeds to market these to anyone who'll listen, even people who are mining at the time. It's my right. grandmother's recipe uh, and... It, wow, it's got a trade. Your grandma had a trademark or did you add the trademark? Uh, she had the trademark. She, I mean, she, you know, she was like Nostradamus. She was like, oh man, Minecraft's going to be massive one day. I'm going to make a pie recipe for it. Having developed a reputation as the server's resident sleeper, it shouldn't surprise anyone that B00 speedruns getting hold of a bed and a clock. But he's scared of more than just things that go bump in the night. Don't start out in a birch forest, please. Oh man, dude. Usually birch forests scare me. But there's so much of it, I think maybe I have to embrace it. Hello there, tall person. <sighs> oh my gosh. Oh, that scared me so bad. To his credit, he isn't scared of digging out a zombie spawner below the spot he initially picks for his base, but then after gathering some materials and saddling up his horse, he decides to build further back into the forest, so he's left with more room for expansion and a more impressive distance fog effect for his starter house because his starter house is a towering diorite obelisk, which apparently has more room to build in than the Crescent Moon House from Season 8, despite being a little thin in spots. Still, the topmost platform provides unrivaled views of the spawn area, so he can point and laugh as pillagers raid Impulse's house. Watch out, pillagers! To destroy you, be careful. Iskal85 reacts well to the monolith. What is that? Oh no! Oh no! No. Why? But he has other more pressing matters to attend to, like pressing some villagers together until they make more villagers. Luckily he stumbles upon and saves a villager on his way back from caving, then teams up with Stress Monster to rescue two more. Stress has dibs on those, but Iskal barters for their firstborn child, barters with Doc M for some decent enchantments, and builds a mountainside home for his boys. Tommy, meet Tommy. Once they're producing babies and not just carrots, he zombifies and cures them so they can produce carrots again. Much like Rendog, he's out to feed the early game hermit's bottomless appetites with a lifetime supply of easily traded golden carrots. These naturally need stress testing before the storefront can open, but once the shop is up and running, passers-by line up to give him diamonds and opinions, and he puts together a melon and pumpkin farm for more easy emerald fodder. Here is your cake. Oh. 
Oh, oh wait, you can't, you can't pick this up. <laughs> <laughs> Stress Monster puts her half of the rescued villagers to work, helping her upgrade from iron tools. Having farmed carrots for an unfathomable amount of time, she recruits a handful of the blacksmith's professions, and pretty soon she's kitted out with a full set of diamond armor and tools, give or take the shovel. But hey, there's more where that came from. I feel like I need to make this pretty in some way. I cleared a space. We have a space now to actually put a little building. Her teapot base becomes a full tea set as she nestles a pair of wooden teacups among the azalea trees on the shore of the lake, which both conceal the entrance to the villager hall and provide the potential for a shop of her own once she's done using it as a starter base. God knows what I'm going to sell in the tea shop. Probably some tea. Um, and some other things. In the meantime, False Symmetry locks herself up in Stress's bedroom because she thought it was a jail. I could, I could stick, I'm sticking into her base fully. I'm fully in her base. I need to ask her why she's got a cage in her base. Okay, let's see. It's her bedroom. I mean, you do you, Stress. <laughs> It's a cradle false, it's so you won't fall out. You should know, you already took a life of full damage along with Jevin, Corrales, Pearl, and whoever else stopped by the miraculous wonder pillar of scaffolding the hermits had built to the top of the world. Due to server lag, the trick of landing into a water bucket proves itself too hard to pull off, but the entire incident highlights all too well the hermit's ability to be infinitely entertained by a hole in the ground for two seasons straight. False's own bedroom has moved off the mighty eagle's back to the perching log it resides on, and some mild terraforming around the place ensures the enormous branch doesn't <laughs> stick out too much. Well, I just had the scare of my life. Um, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break for it. I'm gonna make a break for it. Oh, he's there! He's there! He walked back out again! He walked back out again! Tango Tech applies similar efforts to his house on stilts, and it ends up locking him out of his own home. Tango, when you build the pond, make sure the distance between the door and the edge of the pond is, is kind of close so that people can actually get into the building. We wouldn't expect that to be the last time, given his announcement to start potentially living in the next decked out, whenever that comes around. And yes, it will include a warden as the primary threat, and yes, we are looking forward to the quirky oddball sitcom Tango and Warden, where the two learn to get along and live together over the span of several seasons, thanks for asking. In the meantime, the developmental energy is channeled at a one-of-a-kind copper farm, which also involves an unreasonable amount of hostile creatures in it. Unlike the usual design, this one is using zombies to spawn more zombies by hurting them with magma blocks, but also healing them back the whole time with harming potions infinitely dispensed by witches that in turn are targeting a snowman and continuously missing. <gasps> Holy cow! The whole row is lit up! Um... This might not be good. That's when it like it triples. I mean, of course, the race are still ridiculous. Look at this. this uh, it's making a lie on me. It's a good thing the lake at spawn is now inhabited by more than just the trident slinging drowned. XB Crafted has taken up residence below the surface, starting with a series of geometric farm plots just floating above the water, then drying out a tank underneath and filling it with storage. It's cleaned up a bit. And I got rid of the torches, brought all the stuff from upstairs. It looks very, very clean, which I like. The urge to build underwater highlights the lack of helpful enchantments on his boots, so he heads over to Impulse's new enchanting shop, where he gets immediate customer service and gets to show off the profits from his deep slate mining sessions. Like, you can just customize enchants, I think? That is indeed what, how what? it works. Oh, oh. hi. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, um, um, hello? <laughs> the Deep is kind to Wells Knight and at least provides him with enough to deliver a nice and cozy starter house. It's a classic oak sandstone combination on a shape we've seen him build many times. Though getting there still requires roaming around the SMP in search of levels and enchantments. Also the Nether, which is a whole thing. Only our Nether spawn this season is better than our nether spawn last season. Last season we had like a basalt delta and it was... Of, of course. By contrast, Corrales' mining trip throws a double cave spider spawner at him, which would be a curse on even the most experienced player, and it was for him, but eventually the venomous spiders just end up an XP farm. But this is gonna be for everybody to use, cause, cause, cause that is what communities are all about. Yeah! Yeah! Empowered by the influx of good enchants, Corrales soon establishes his own homestead, a humble abode looking more like a modern mansion and spacious enough for a super smelter and a sugarcane farm to fit in unnoticed. Okay, it's getting to the cozy factor. Might even be too bright in here. Just gotta be careful with lighting elements, because the walls are made of snow, and a rogue jack-o'-lantern will easily make half a house into a snow golem. 
A different luck with spawners hits a Zuma Void, and then it pulls a bow and hits him again. It's a skeleton spawner. Quickly redoing the dangerous dungeon into a bone meal and enchantments dispenser, X nevertheless decides that villager-based farming is the way to go. Therefore, a wheat farm is in order, and one that fits perfectly within the other three walls he put around the one wall from episode one. The villager for it might have fit a little too well, though. It's suffocated in a wall. We're saying it's suffocated in a wall. Where is it? Where is it gone? Where on earth did- And then watch what happens when we hoe the soil. So what happened was we dropped our villager in the minecart onto the farmland that's directly above those rails, and that must have suffocated and unfortunately killed the villager. Perhaps to ward off any more unwanted visitors, or maybe just to remind us she's an absolute boss at building organics, Pearlescent Moon's next move is to build a spooky alien creature above her starter house, which also gets an expansion to establish it more firmly amid the other developments at spawn. You can decide for yourselves if this or the salmon yeaters have a more threatening aura. Painful. They just keep going. But as she puts up one giant beast, she leads the group in taking down another, suggesting that a group teams up to fight the ender dragon, but they do it wearing leather hats and wielding wooden swords. Just go for it. Well, I mean, we are professional Minecrafters, right, guys? Like, this should be easy. I mean, <laughs> yeah, easy <laughs> with wooden swords, right? I mean, we kill the dragon. Loads. <laughs> It goes about as well as you'd expect, but we expect great things from the Hermitcraft server after all. Once the dust settles, Pearl gets to take the dragon egg home as a souvenir, but considering Grian's already been poking around her stuff, we're taking bets now on how long it'll stay there. A separate group of hermits went even deeper into the end to stock up on shulker boxes and otherwise useful gear. Funny how the shulkers were deemed worthy of their actual armor instead of the gang clowning on them like they did on the dragon. Regardless, iJevin comes back to the overworld with plenty of square backpacks and looking for something to fill those with. So seeing how the ground didn't just spew out a spawner at him, Jevin puts together his own one, a tried and true flushable mob farm design. You know, the one that looks like a Tesla coil, kind of. In the meantime, his home is decorated and his horse is blown up. Speed was good, it's a little bit hard to be a speedy horse when you're dead though. <laughs> So it's a good thing Elytra is now available. But not to Scar, he straight falls out of the sky. Since 2000, ow, 10. That's two months of momentum of falling there. So after a long episode working on her treehouse, Gemini Tay comes out to her front porch to see a custom tree five times her size. The good times have indeed landed. Being inexplicably an elf for the season, Scar planted a whole Yggdrasil to live out of. The scale and the look of it are a stark contrast and a grand achievement for someone just recently being murdered for his mutton every other minute. Really, that netherite hoe had better have some silk touch on it if he's to continue spreading the greenery this big and this fast. As for how he even has a netherite hoe... Let's set our spawn and let's get ourselves some nether. Oh no, I didn't. Turns out Basalt Delta is not the worst that could happen to a person. Outmatched on the tree front, Jem fires back with a giant bow and arrows. Quite appropriately, I suppose. At the moment, it's just a statue dabbing, but that's okay. I'm gonna fix it. To offload the bones and archery equipment from the impulse made spawner, Jem builds a fletching shop, crowned with an organic statue of an archer. Coincidentally, that statue is aiming right at Pearl's monstrous murder deer. Maybe that's why the trust exercises don't work a treat. It's, a, tr it's yes. a trust exercise. You ready? Okay. It's a tr okay. I'm ready. Yep. I'm gonna give it back. Mm-hmm. Just not today. Pearl! With the bones disposed of, Gem eyeballs her next farming target, mutually, because it's Guardians. She's been wanting to play with Prismarine blocks for a while, but never got the chance because of how hard the farm is to set up. Will she finally undertake a temple drain, or is this another sign to be changed as soon as Impulse shows up? Only time will tell. It wouldn't be the weirdest use of the ocean we've heard of. As he sets up a modern starter house based on a design by Weeder Dude, Vintage Beef reveals that his week one wool farm is not preparing for a wool shop. Instead, he plans to set up a Hermitcraft trading and battling card game, using map arts to create cards for the Hermits themselves along with various items from Minecraft, and eventually land on something akin to the Pokemon TCG. It's all fun and games until your grandfather ends up in the Shadow Realm. If any Hermits are watching this and you want to help me build a single map, you get a free builder deck. You get a builder's deck because you built a map with me, so... But since this requires making a stone ocean to mock up all these cards with, Beef also shares his perspective on the group trip to the Stronghold and the Ender Dragon fight, which is worth watching just for more leather hat and wooden sword schadenfreude. Also, pretty effective mob farm at night. Yikes. Despite his diligent work on the community area at spawn, the crafting bench thief seems to have struck beneath Joe Hills' nose. 
In the midst of this mystery, Joe decides it's a good time to think about where to build his starter base. After all, Doc M points out that the other side of the river has eagles and teapots, whereas Zedaf literally lives under a rock. Wow, that actually is really cool. Oh, fantastic, I love the texturing especially, very cool. It's a cozy rock though, and Joe gets a tour of it before stepping out to decide where he wants to build, chatting to people as he goes. Eventually he settles on a spot neighbouring Doc M and erects a dirt mansion which will be replaced over time with a more permanent material. You know what, next episode we're going to come in here and we're going to put in some real materials and I'm going to show y'all what I'm doing there. Quite a few people already guessed that the only person with enough patience and moxie to mine out this much obsidian and swap every crafting bench for it is Cubfan135. Even more people guess that he'd just do it for the lols and the giggles. Why? Because we can. <laughs> well, I mean, there's not really a reason. Some men just want to watch the world burn. Uh, not really burn, but just be minorly inconvenienced for no apparent reason. Luckily for him, a pumpkin pie is craftable even in an inventory grid, so Cub embraces Rendog's business model and expands the docks up front of the pie factory, planning to incorporate a drive through into the design so people can get a coffee without leaving their boat. And we're also planning on, like I said, a coffee shop inside of this area underneath the Giga Pies. So let me show you that. Uh, but you can buy potions and stuff in here, and then you can just boat on out. And finally, there's Doc M, who, after putting the pedal to the metal in the first episode, looks around to find a lot of his neighbors are moving just as fast, but in a different direction. Even though they're coming to him for enchanted books to get geared up, it's usually because there's a big house project on the horizon. Doc's focus remains on the technical, and while he's back to being the kind of magician who won't tell you how he got all those flowers up his sleeve, he'll dazzle you with what else those poppies can turn into. In this case, he creates a system which can remotely drain sand out of his inventory faster than he can instamine it, and sets up a chunk loader so he can keep it running when he's thousands of blocks away, then builds an eco-architectural sandstone house to both live in and sell sand out of. Oh, and he's also mind-controlling all the zombies on the server now, so let's maybe keep an eye on that. I got messages from some hermits asking me weird questions like dog. Did you also see that something strange with our zombie seems they form lines? What happens if you put a turtle egg at 000 globally? So any zombie that is loaded by any other hermit will start tracking towards this egg. And that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Loy XP, and my name is Pixel Riffs. Captions on this video were provided by Liara. If you want to sink your teeth into more epic builds, check out Zloy flexing his steampunk architectural chops in his latest video linked in the end screen theater this week. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.